So I was looking at the videos I've put up and I noticed that I have dozens of videos on women's health. And unfortunately, in many medical schools, men's specific health gets sort of overlooked. And so I've decided to make a set of videos that are devoted to various problems that specifically come up in men. Things like uh, BPH, uh, cancer of the prostate, cancer of the testicles, um, erectile dysfunction. So expect to see these videos coming out um, if you watch my video sequentially uh, over the next several days. Um, and I think this will be useful for you because many of these problems are things that you will see in the outpatient clinic and they are very common, including this first topic that we're going to talk about and that is benign prostatic hyperplasia, commonly incorrectly referred to as benign prostatic hypertrophy. This is just an enlarged prostate. Colloquially, people re will refer to this as an enlarged prostate. So we'll get into this. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so BPH, uh, and that's how I'm gonna refer to this, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. It's an enlargement of the prostate that's not due to any kind of malignancy or infection. The most significant consequence and the way that this manifests is due to a bladder outflow obstruction. It is by far and away the most common uh, cause of a bladder outflow obstruction, which if you watch my nephrology videos, remember that this can cause, if it gets severe enough, post-renal failure. Okay, so that's important. Now, the etiology of BPH is multifactorial. However, what we do know is that DHT is believed to play an important role, and DHT increases with age. So what is DHT? So we take testosterone. There's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, and that converts it into DHT, which is a much more potent form of testosterone. So that's very, very important, and this increases with age. And DHT, by the way, is responsible for many processes uh, that are male-specific. So think of things like prostate enlargement. Think of things like male pattern baldness. And so this 5-alpha reductase enzyme is a target for uh, slowing or even preventing those things. So as I said, prevalence increases with age. BPH affects about 42% of men age 51 to 60, so very prevalent. And once you get to men in their 70s, it's over 80%. So increasing prevalence with age, that is the major risk factor. Now, there are a number of manifestations that involve the lower urinary tract. Collectively, you'll often hear these referred to as lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs. So the first is hesitancy. This is difficulty starting a urinary stream. So they get to the urinal and they try to pee and they can't. Some men experience this psychologically if they're nervous to urinate, maybe around others, maybe in a public restroom, that's hesitancy. Many men have experienced this. A weak urinary stream is exactly what it sounds like. It's difficulty maintaining a forceful urinary stream. Um, and this can be a problem because as a man starts to urinate, if it's not, if he's standing at a urinal, if it's not strong enough, it can drip onto the floor or onto his shoes. Post void dribbling is when you're done and urine involuntarily begins to uh, come out of the urethra. Frequency, now we're getting into more uh, bladder type symptoms. Uh, this is increased trips to the toilet every hour or two. So if you're going and peeing six, seven times a day, that is probably abnormal, especially if you're not drinking a lot of water. Um, so we not only look at how often they're going, but you know how much are you peeing? Are you standing by the toilet for three or four seconds? Or is it you know 30 or 40 seconds? In which case we might think, 
well, you're probably drinking a lot of water. Urgency is a sudden strong need to urinate, and then nocturia means that you're waking up more than once to urinate. It is normal to wake up once in the middle of the night to urinate, but more than that, we consider that nocturia. Younger men with similar symptoms, you should think of a urethral stricture, and so in that case, uh, you should visualize the urethra. This is the anatomy of the prostate. Notice that there are a number of zones. That's going to come into play. Um, but notice that the prostate kind of sits around the urethra after it leaves the bladder and kind of uh, hugs it. Um, so it's, it, it's circumferential around the urethra, and that makes the urethra very susceptible to compression if there is enlargement of the prostate. So here are these various zones. Uh, prostate cancer is usually in these more peripheral zones right here in green and BPH usually originates in this transitional zone in purple and that makes sense because if you are uh, if you have hyperplasia there you're very close to the urethra and so you can get those uh, those symptoms that are consistent with BPH namely obstruction now, the initial workup upon suspicion is to do a digital rectal exam. That is part of your physical exam. So if you have a man coming in with urinary symptoms, those LUTs symptoms, uh, then what you're going to do is a digital rectal exam. Always, 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 okay? Um, now, are digital rectal exams recommended routinely in asymptomatic patients? No, but a digital rectal exam is indicated for a man with urinary problems. Uh, urinalysis with culture will be useful. Uh, free and total serum PSA is going to be very useful, so always order that. That's two separate orders on CCS. And then get a CBC and a BMP. And we want to know if there's any kind of renal dysfunction. And so what you should see on digital rectal exam, this is very, very important you know this, is a smooth, firm, elastic enlargement. It is confluent. There's no nodules. It's kind of, it's not soft, but it's not indurated either. So there's no irregularities or indurations. The urinalysis is going to be unremarkable. There is very rarely bleeding uh, into the urethra. This is not cancer. Uh, the free and total serum PSA, they will be high. Um, so the total will be high. However, the free to total ratio will be normal. So basically, the prostate is just making more PSA. And some of it's going to be free and some of it's going to be total, but the ratio is going to be normal. Now, this is different from when you get to prostate cancer. The BPH is a surrogate for prostate volume. So the higher the PSA is, the larger the prostate is. Now, a higher BPH does not necessarily mean cancer, so you don't want to fall into that trap. CBC is usually unremarkable. This will help you exclude infection. Um, and then the BMP uh, will help you assess for hematuria, which may mean a possible cancer, especially bladder cancer. Or if there's a presence of white cells and esterase, uh, then it may mean that you're dealing with a urinary tract infection. Now, when you look at the PSA, you need to consider the age because the upper limit of normal, uh, de it depends on the age, okay? Now, uh, further workup, if it's consistent with BPH, you want to do a bladder and prostate ultrasound and a urophlometry, and that will give you a hint as to whether you're dealing with an actual symptomatic BPH. Although in many cases, this is just for quantitative analysis. It's not, um, it, it's not to uh, question the patient's symptoms. Um, most patients will be able to tell you my stream is less than it used to be five, six years ago. Um, so with the ultrasound, you can check for the post-void residual, and this is going to be higher in patients with BPH. And uroflowmetry will show a low flow rate, less than 10 mils per second. There's an instrument you can use for this, although I do not believe that this is an option on CCS, so I'm only including it for your information. Differential urethral stricture, consider that in a young man with LUTS symptoms. 
Uh, you can diagnose this on urethrogram. Overactive bladder tends to have urgency and frequency as the stars of the symptoms, but they will not have difficulty emptying their bladder and the post void residual will be normal. Prostatitis will be an enlarged prostate, but it will be tender. BPH is not tender. Also look for signs of infection like fever and elevated white count. Prostate cancer is asymmetric and nodular as opposed to smooth and confluent. They will also have an, I'm sorry, this should say PSA. They'll also have an elevated PSA but they will have a low free to total PSA, okay? So their free PSA is going to be relatively low compared to the total increase in their PSA, and that really uh, can help you distinguish it from BPH. Urinary tract infection, look for dysuria, sudden onset. Um, it's very temporary. Um, it does not come on over the course of months. It comes on over the course of days, and it's fairly rare in men to begin with. Now, the principles of management is to relieve the symptoms. Uh, so medical management is first line in most patients, and surgery is reserved for patients who don't respond to medical management over the course of a couple years or patients with significant urologic complications. So what are our medical options? Well, these two are the most commonly used. So the alpha-1 blockers, terazosin, doxazosin, tamsulosin, which is Flomax, they don't reduce the size of the prostate. However, they do help the smooth muscle relax, which encourages more flow. And this is usually the first drug to manage BPH. So you have a patient come in, they've got mild BPH, they want something to help them urinate better, the alpha-1 blocker is the first one we typically go to because it works the fastest. Now, another drug you can go to are the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride. These actually reduce the size of the prostate, and these would be indicated to go to faster if they are if it's a larger prostate. Now, in most cases, we do both of these together, um, but uh, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, unfortunately, they don't work very quickly. They take several weeks to work. So we'll start with an alpha-1 blocker, um, and then if that's not enough, we'll add the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, or you can go to both right off the bat. The PDE5 inhibitors is good for patients with BPH who also have pre-existing erectile dysfunction, which is many of them. So you can go for something like Tadalafil. Anticholinergics like Tolteridine and Bethanicol have some pretty bothersome side effects, so we don't use those too much. Beta-3 agonists, Mirabegron, uh, those can raise blood pressure, so be careful with those. Many of these patients are older and already have those sorts of issues. And then, like I said, combinations are commonly used. Here's a, an algorithm that you may or may not use, um, but what I'm giving you here in this lecture is pretty much all you need to know for BPH. Indications for surgery include once this really begins to affect the kidneys, if there's bladder stones due to urinary stasis, gross hematuria that does not go away, uh, recurrent urinary retention, and inadequate response or adverse effects to medical management, we give them one to two years before we say they failed the medical management. Surgical approaches, there are a number of surgical approaches. Uh, the gold standard is TERP, transurethral resection of the prostate. Uh, there are a number of post-operative complications. The vast majority of patients will have some ejaculatory dysfunction, i.e. retrograde ejaculation. Uh, a small minority will have erectile dysfunction. And then there's something called transurethral resection syndrome. I'm not going to go into that in detail, uh, but it's very interesting. So you can certainly feel Feel free to go look that up on your own time. You will not be tested on that. Other less invasive surgical approaches, like I said, are available. So to recap, BPH is an enlargement of the prostate, not related to malignancy or infection. DHT is thought to play an important role, and we target the production of DHT in our management. BPH originates in the periurethral transitional zone, whereas cancer originates in the peripheral zone. Manifestations are urinary in uh, nature, so think of starting or maintaining a stream, post-void dribbling, frequency, urgency, and nocturia. A younger man presenting with similar symptoms should be considered for urethral stricture, get a, a urethrogram. Workup should include a free and total PSA and a prostate ultrasound. And mainstays are, uh, of therapy are medical management, which includes alpha-1 blockers, usually given first, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors given 
as in addition to that, uh, or later if they fail the alpha blockers alone. Surgical management is done if medical management fails or the patient can't tolerate it. TERP is the gold standard, but less invasive procedures exist.